This is Natalie Pace, and I have the great honor today of featuring Ed Moore. He is a coronation champion of King Charles III, but more importantly, he's the eco-coordinator and level three teacher at Damer's First School in Poundbury, England. And they've been successful in winning all kinds of eco awards under his aegis. Um, and he's gonna tell us about the obstacles, the challenges of going green and the solutions. All right, Ed, um, I did give you a brief introduction, but I thought that a picture is worth a thousand words. So I have the slideshow that's on that blog that we co-wrote together, 11 tips to make schools go green. And I'd love for you to sh you know, just tell us a little bit about each slide. Um, and then we can come back and ask you questions about how you were able to do this at your own school. Give me one second. All right. You can take it away here. Yeah, so some children got got the chance to meet uh, the Queen uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, amazing opportunity. Uh, she was there to unveil um, Queen Mother Square, the Queen Mother statue, uh, yeah. with, uh, with with King Charles. Um, real, a real special day, and you know the whole school uh, managed to get out and 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 get to see her. A real special occasion. Really cool. And we know who this is. This is Jane Goodall, but she was there for, with a special award for your school, right? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so we got to speak to Jane, tell her all about the the amazing uh, environmental work that we were working on. And uh, yeah, she gave us um, a special award. We were named as the best uh, educational institution um, in the UK. Uh, and that was up against university, secondary schools as well. Wow. So, you know, you know, our school is four to nine. So that, you know, an, an amazing achievement. Yeah. And I want to underscore that four to nine year olds. I always call them the best uh, green lobby in England. But of course, that's with your great guidance. All right. Let's take a quick look at this one. Oh, there you are. Uh, this is one of your mini awards, but shout out. You just became a coronation champion, right, for King Charles. Did any special awards come along with that or the, just the feel-good honor of being named? Um, yeah, the feel-good honor. I, I, I got a, you know, I got a really special certificate signed by the king uh, and, a, and a pin badge as well. And I put it in a, in a frame. It's in a, in a special frame, a UV frame as well. So the, so, uh, the, the signature doesn't ever fade. Um, wow, and yeah, awesome. amazing, amazing occasion. Got to go to the coronation concert as well and see all those yeah. amazing artists. And um, yeah, such a great occasion to be a part of. And yeah, I feel very humbled. That's well, it's I think it's well deserved. You certainly work hard. And we'll talk more about your hard work in a moment. But tell us a little bit about this area. Oh, so the, this is uh, this is our nature area. Um, and, you know, the school children, they raise the funds for it. Uh, you know, they wanted to nature own a pond and they, you know, they made the money through uh, the young enterprise work that we do, uh, the, the recycle programs that we do as well across the community. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's heavily used and what a great, you know, what a great outside area to, you know, for the children to learn from. Yeah, uh, you know, natural biodiversity, native plants, all amazing things. And we'll talk more about that. But let tell us a little bit about this area. Oh, so this is the this is the reading area. So uh, you know you can see out there now. You can see the the great field and Poundbury, amazing views um, of the area. And uh, yeah, this is where you can you know tell stories. Uh, children can come out, you know, learn from nature, enjoy nature. Um, yeah, just a fast, fantastic you know outside area. With you know we're so lucky to have. And how do you feel about that real quickly? I mean, you know, telling a story with such a picturesque background, what's the difference in terms of how the students react to the storytelling? Oh, they love it. Um, they're so much more relaxed, I think. Um, and, you know, you can tune in to all the, the you know, the, the birds and the, and the insects, you know, uh, and it's just such a peaceful a peaceful area to, you know, to, um, you know, relax and, you know, enjoy, enjoy nature. Yeah. 
That's and and that's a key part of this, right? Is getting kids out of the classroom. They're still, in fact, I would argue, and I'm sure you do too, in all of your fundraising attempts, that they learn better this way, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so here is another outdoor learning area. Yeah, so this is the this is the outside classroom. So you you know when it's raining or it's windy or come rain, snow or shine through all the seasons, um, fantastic to be able to get children out outside. But if it's raining, it doesn't matter because you've got a roof on it and it's you know it's heavily used by by classes. Uh, to teach all kinds of subjects, really. Uh, it could be science, it could be geography, history, literacy, a bit of maths. Um, it's everything. Uh, and, you know, we even have talks, people that come in and give talks. And, you know, if they're linking that with the outside area, what a great resource yeah. to be able to be in there learning, learning about it, but, you know, outside. Well, you know, I was going to ask this as one of my questions. Um, these are two extraordinary structures, right? And the, I mean, it's not complicated, but you do have some materials you have to purchase and someone has to build it. So where'd you get the funding? Who built it? Who designed it and all of that? Yeah, so um, a special company, outside company, um, they they designed it and they built it. Um, it took about a week to put it together. It was a, you know, quite a big structure. Um, Obviously, the floor had to be, um, you know, you, you can concrete the floor if you wish, or you just build it straight onto the grass. Um, and the, the funds were the funds were raised through grants and, and funding um, that we got from businesses, uh, from charity organisations related to, related to the environment. Um, they gave the, money, the funds to be able to, you know, have it built. Wow. So your angle on the environmental grants would be get the kids outside, right? Yeah, 100%. 100 so important. So important now for health and well-being. Um, so important to immerse children in nature and get them learning about nature, but also from nature as well. It's so important. Yeah, really, really good. Okay, I've got a couple more pictures. And again, I think this is a good way to get even some of our questions that I wanted to ask you answered. So here's another one, you with Isla Lester. Why I know you love bragging about Isla. So tell us a little bit about her. She's awesome. Like she's unbelievable. She started in my eco crew, um, you know, many, many years ago. And um, yeah, she's now like a famous um aggressive Thunberg <laughs> of Dorchester, I would say. Uh, yes. Well, so, actually, it's called the Isla Lester of Dorchester. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely, definitely. She's so passionate about, you know, saving our world and getting out there, doing lots of litter picking. And, you know, she's an ambassador for, you know, BBC's um, regenerate, re Regenerations, um, you know, also Eco School. She's like a youth ambassador there as well. You know, yeah. she, she's not just doing things on a local scale, but she's doing things on a national scale. And, um, Inter you know, and, and even international she's on funky kids radio in australia right yeah that's right yeah that's projected to like 60 countries across the world amazing it's amazing amazing but and she's so proud of you that's what i love too is you know how how excited she is when she talks about her teacher former teacher mr moore all right here's another one uh composting and we can talk a little bit about composting but this doesn't look like a cheap contraction. So how'd you fund that? And then also, it does it pay back now? Yeah, so uh, we we funded it through uh, Orchard of Promises. Uh, we got lots of um, lots of gifts donated to us. Uh, whether that was like a um, a day on a luxurious yacht or um, twelve bottles of wine or um, lots of different experiences. Yeah. Um, we invited the whole community in to take part in this auction as well as parents and that's how we managed to raise the the five thousand pounds that we needed uh for the ridden and yeah. um and now yes it's, it's paying back we're making so much compost that uh we can now sell it to the to the community and the parents for a donation and we've also got a good link with the town council um the head gone gone gardener there um yeah. and we donated to them too 
So we've got wow. a good little, little business going on. Yeah, that's great. All right, this is another picture of the kids, um, you know, just having fun outside. <laughs> And of course, you know, the, the visionary of Poundbury, do you want to talk a little bit about, I, and I think this is important as well. I mean, I'm sure that it's become symbiotic, right? In that, you know, Poundbury's vision was all based on sustainability. And now it to me is no accident that, you know, it tracks someone like you to come in and be so passionate about making sure that the school is as well. So let's talk a little bit about oh, having having a town built on the, the you know, the um, ethos of sustainability and how that inspires you. Yeah, um, you know, my journey started, I think my granddad inspired me. Um, you know, he he um, he grew everything from seed. Uh, he was a big, pa that was his big passion. He would never go to the supermarket, um, you know, if he didn't have anything that, uh, that he could cook with. He would, you know, substitute for something else if that wasn't in the yeah. recipe or... Or, or he would even, even, you know, he'd even make his own bread. Uh, he would never yeah. go out to shops and buy it. He would uh, make his own bread. And, you, you know, when you could, when you could have like children around in your, you know, your houses back in the 60s, 70s, he would have them, he would be there in his, you know, it would be in his element, in his garden, teaching all the children how to grow, how to grow food. And, you know, we take it so much for granted now to think that we've pretty much gone 360, haven't we? That, uh, yeah. We're now encouraging children to do what they were doing back in the in the seventies when he was, you know, teaching children. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny because uh, my uh, my niece has a magnet on her refrigerator: eat organic food, or as our grandparents would call it, just food. <laughs> right? Like we are, yeah. we're going back to <laughs> grandpa's time. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more, and we do have another slide to show. Um, but I, it brings to mind your idea, which you probably have in full swing now, about having a meatless meal each week. Are you doing that, or is that still in the planning stages? Yeah, we're still. Yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, having a having a meat free day or a plant based, a super plant based day. Um, yeah, as we like to call it. Have put it, swing it on the positive. Um, and then, to be honest, the children don't. You know. They don't know the difference really. Um, they don't. They they taste the food and they're they're fine with it. You know, they enjoy it and they wouldn't know any better. Now, how do you? I mean, because we know about suppliers, and we'll talk a little bit about changing that. But who prepares the food? Who whose recipes are you using? All of that sort of thing. I mean, sure, I'm sure there was a little bit of back end involved on getting this going. Yeah. So um, we have a company uh, that we're assigned to. And they um, they prepare and and uh, get the food into our kitchen, and then obviously then we do the prep work with it, and then cook it. Uh, and it was a bit of a it was a bit of a two and a fro with them uh, with from the children. The children wanted a, a plant based meal every week, yeah. uh, and um, obviously there's there's a few regulations here that you've got to abide by. You've got to have so many fruit and veg um, per day within meals. Um, but they were very accommodating and they listened to the children. They aren't listened to their, you know, what they wanted. And they, um, yeah, they were, they were very clever in, in what they did because in the, in just in the tomato puree, they managed to get five vegetables just within that by juicing it up. Um, oh, and making it wow. Yeah. And that was, a, that was a good way around it. And you don't, you know, and you don't taste it. It doesn't taste any different than the tomato sauce that you'd have on an all pizza if you, you know, went to a restaurant or a or a supermarket. Now, let me ask you this: Are you guys incorporating the fruit and veg from your own gardens into the lunches, or how do you how does that work? Yeah, so the the fruit uh, the fruit is incorporated into snack time. So mm -hmm. um, so every uh, throughout the throughout the school, um, there's uh, there's break time. We call it break time, and uh, in during break time, uh, the 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 fruit is uh, allocated in there. Um, yeah. We try and grow. We grow through the season. So at the moment, we're 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 inundated at the moment with plenty of raspberries, raspberries, uh -huh. blackberries, uh, yeah. strawberries come much later this year. Bizarrely, wow, wow. Yeah, we've got lots of strawberries coming. Uh, apples are 
they're a bit sour, but they're edible. They, you know, the children are enjoying them, and the pears are pretty good as well. So some of the some of the artists, some of the fruits are come a bit later this year, but um, yeah, we've got we've got a, a big a big crop going on. Wow. And what about the the veg? Are you able to incorporate that at all? Like have a salad bar or anything? Or yeah, so most of the most of the food now goes into our food tech, our DT work um, uh -huh. for for cookery because it's really important now that we teach children how to how to use the utensils um, yes. to encourage them on on how to cook. Uh, so a lot of the food of the veg side goes into the into the into the DT kitchens uh, where, you know, the children can then prepare that food that they've grown and then cook it, uh, cook a dish, whether that's a soup. Um, last summer we made loads of crumbles, crumbles galore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, rhubarb and rhubarb and black, uh, black currant crumbles and things. So yeah, now that it's going into, into our, you know, DT work. How exciting. Oh, just FYI, the Edible Schoolyard has some of Alice Waters' recipes that you might be able to snag, which are really good. She's a very famous chef. You'll want them. Okay, I'll, uh, I will I want to show a couple more slides, and then I have a few more questions for you. So um, this last slide that I wanted to show is your chicken coop. Well, there's your gardens. We just talked about that. But here's your chicken coop. So tell us a little bit about this. Like, um, first of all, who cleans the chicken coop? Because that looks like a boatload of work. And is this another thing that the kids are cooking in the kitchens? Or are you selling those too? Yeah, so I know. I think it's nicknamed like a mini Buckingham Palace going on. Um, yeah, amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, amazing, uh, amazing coop. Uh, so... The uh, the eggs have been cooked with, um, yeah. and the, the the staff. There's a big staff rotor. If you want to get involved, you can. If you don't, that's fine. But there's big staff rotor that basically looks after the chickens. Um, every, you know, over the weekends, over the evenings, um, and yeah, it's a great system. Everyone enjoys it. And then over the summer, they go home. They go home with a with a member of staff, and they get they're in their in you know they're in their garden for six weeks and then they come back to school uh so yeah it's, it's a it's fantastic you know you know we've seen children excelling their language and their speech just through talking to a to a chicken um <laughs> which you know which is fantastic you know they might not have the confidence to talk to children other children or adults but they're happy to talk to a chicken and you know that's one great example that is so interesting oh wow okay so when I was, you know, I've visited, I've had the pleasure of visiting Poundbury and Damers multiple times, but one time I was there and I was talking with your former head teacher, Catherine Smith, um, and she was showing me the kitchen and she was just explaining, you know, sometimes how difficult it is to get, you know, a new idea inserted into an existing blueprint, you know, and how hard it was for her to get that kitchen installed in the you know in the design of the school so i want to talk a little bit like what do you think was your most challenging obstacle to overcome in any one you've had so many campaigns but which one was the most challenging wow um yeah cool um it, it was probably um there's so many um you know from when we first started with the garden and building the yeah. garden and find a, a contractor to like build it and the plans and uh you know and putting that in place and then trying to just trying to then set it all up with finding seeds and plants and yeah you know trying to get people to donate things because obviously school budgets at the moment are you know they're quite short on on yeah. money and uh you, that was tough you know that was uh you know that took a lot of hard work you know going on gumtree and going on uh, you know, marketplace and going around the community and sort of trying to persuade people that we're yeah. doing this amazing project. You know, we need the children to learn about growing. Will you donate, you know, yeah. some blueberry bushes? Will you donate, you know, and going into garden centers? And and that was tough. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I look back now and think, God, oh, you know, I spent my Easter holidays literally just going door to door you know, carry on working sort of thing. And 
Um, but it was all worth it in the end. And, you know, look at us now. You know, we're a five-star RHS garden. Um, you know, we've won countless awards for our gardens. And the children are, you know, they're enjoying growing in school, but they're loving it out. You know, they're they're, they're able to, to share their knowledge with their parents. And whether that's growing in pots or in their garden or even signing up for allotment as well that's you know it's amazing it's amazing to see so now that you have chickens and a garden and outdoor learning areas and even solar panels and we're going to also talk about your kids you know over i think you said over 60 percent are coming to school by bike or walking etc um now that you're kind of the model and you've won all these awards, is it easier, you think, with each little thing that you do? Uh, yeah, I think now we've got everything in place and in stone, set in stone. Um, it, yeah, it, it just, it now just becomes natural. And, you know, we've got a good base now of, of grants that come in. We've got a good base with businesses. They're always wanting to link in with us. Um, with our environmental work, you know, it's great for them on the PR front, but it's great for us on the funding yeah. front. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, but it's been, you know, it's taken 10, 11 years to get here at this point. And, you know, a lot of hard grafting and a lot of, you know, after schools, weekends, summer holidays, school holidays to, to get there. You know, and it's, I think it's important that I know I haven't had any extra time during, you know, during my schooling. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a primary school teacher at the end of the day. That's my job. Uh, this is, uh, you know, like an extracurricular, um, yeah. you know, a subject on the side, uh, but it's a passion of mine. So, you know, I want to yeah. drive that through. Yeah. And chances are there might be a few people who want to consult with you on how they can do this in their own schools. So hopefully that's in your future in a big way. Um, let's talk about this uh, plastic free school. And what I love as well is, it, you know, when we first started talking, which was many moons ago, um, you know, things were difficult and you were having to like you would you would first send out a ship and it would come back to you empty. And, you know, you were finding all kinds of ways to get around these challenges and obstacles. And now when I ask you about meatless you know, or let's call it plant-based, your plant-based build, you're like, oh, it was a bit of back and forth, you know? So you're you're accustomed to it a little more, but let's talk about how going plastic-free, that's not easy. And there's a lot of schools that are still, everything that comes into their school is drowned in plastic. So what can what counsel can you give other teachers, administrators, and parents about eliminating plastic from their school? Um, my first thing, and my first thing for everything, I think, is you know, don't take no for an answer. Keep on Good. going. If someone says no to you, keep on going with it. If you solely believe that, you know, you can become single use plastic free, you can do it. And that's what the children did. You know, they wanted to change their milk cartons to glass bottles and beakers. And we wrote letters to the company and they were like, all for it. That's fine. Brilliant. We'll do it. Um, same for the veg as well. That was a bit to and fro in over 12 months. And I think we wore down the manager. <laughs> uh, who got sick and tired of our letters, let alone our phone calls, let alone, you know, I would phone up and then hand over to uh, to Louis, who would then, you know, tell tell the manager what he thought. And um, Was, Is Louis you know, one of your students? No, I'm one of my students, yeah. You know, he left our school a couple of years ago, and at the time he was, he was nine years old, and, you know, he was taking on a CEO of a big uh, vegetable and fruit company. <laughs> Um, Love it. And, um, yeah, just wore, wore them down in the end. They decided, right, you can have them in the boxes as long as you do a bit of a research project for us. Uh, then you can have it in the boxes, you know, and then perhaps we could get more schools. If it works, yeah. we'd get more schools to do it. Yeah, and pilot pilot programs. That's yeah, exactly. it. I think that's those are two words I think everybody needs to know is they pilot programs, you know, let us be, let us try it. And if it doesn't work, you know, one thing. And if it does work, great. Then it becomes, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, and keep going with it. Keep going with it. And it works. You know, other schools are doing it now and, you know, haven't, haven't looked back. Now, let's talk also, because you you also slid in there, eliminating single use, because chances are they were water bottles that you drink and toss and milk that you drink and toss. So, you got the milk and glass uh, containers. What about the water bottles that are so, you know, 
just littering everywhere? How did you get rid of those? Yeah, so um, we gave, um, we, we found a company, uh, they did stainless steel bottles. We got them engraved with the school logo on them. And then we gave uh, every child in the school, uh, if you were in reception, you had a free bottle. It was all funded by the PTA and some funding that I got. And then uh, the rest of the bottles, uh, it was um, it was about five pounds, five pounds a bottle, um, uh, you know, trying to encourage children. And every parent bought one. Uh, they were much, you know, can't really get a stainless steel five pound bottle anywhere, I don't think. So yeah. um, it, was a, it was a bargain um, and it's, it's working. You know, we've got some, our, we've got our uh, refillable, um, we got our refillable fountains that the children use all the time, and now in the town as well, through peer pressure from the children, they've got their free refillable fountains as well within the town. So, yeah, it's fantastic. And also, the community are buying the water bottles, so it's a good little PR thing for us. You know, the water bottles are ending up around the world in Ibiza and Barcelona and places, so that's all good. That's really good. You're going to have to share a picture of that. Okay, so we've gone through a lot here. Um, da, 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 let's see. Okay, I think we should talk about transportation because, you know, when we think about CO2 footprint, transportation is the largest. And you see a lot of parents, and it's just sad because I think they think that's just the way life is, that you go at the end of the school and you join this long carpool lineup and you know the emissions are spewing out and the children are waiting there it's bad air quality i mean there's just a thousand things wrong with that and yet you guys have what over 60% coming to school on their bike or walking or on e-scooters so how do you make that something that becomes the norm and the carpool lineup something that's not as as much fun um we we put on loads of events Every half term, we're we're running events, whether that's a fling your bike day, or uh, if it's like a magic golden lock day uh, or week. Um, yeah, we've got lots of events where you know children can take part with in uh, with their parents as well. And they come, you know, come on their bikes and scooters. We just keep on going with it. You know, we we got to keep the momentum going. The momen momentum is so important. Um, right. That is so important in this and in any other environmental campaign that you're doing. You've got to keep the momentum going. And, it, you know, we never look back. We now got a map now where uh, parents can park their cars maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes away and then they can get the, the bike out, the boot, and they can cycle to school. So now we've got clean air going around the school. You know, we haven't got that much traffic. Uh, wow. And, you know, in our big campaign at the moment, you know, we want to link – Poundbury with Dorchester with a with a cycle lane so you know that's been our big project great and uh, so the kids I'm sure are writing lots of letters and oh fantastic yeah. well I hope yeah. to see that next time I come to Poundbury which will definitely be next year is, is there anything else advice that you can give for other teachers or eco coordinators that are meeting with resistance with their suppliers or and also, we should talk a little bit about maybe their administrator is not on board. Do you ever have to wear down the head teacher, you know, to get them on board? Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And if it's something, you know, you feel passionate with, it's always good to put, to put like a proposal together of why, why you think, you know, you know, uh, something that you want should happen. What's the and also what's the impact going to be? I think head teachers always want to know what the impact's going to be on you know, the children, the school, the staff, yeah. the community. And if, you know, if you can tick all those boxes, then they're, they're more likely to say yes. Do you have that proposal available for people that want to reach out to you? Are you willing to, to share? And how can they reach you? I know that, I think you're Eco Ed More, two Ds, E-D-D-M-O-O-R-E, -D -D -E, right, at Instagram. Yeah. Um, anything else that you want to share about how people, I mean, let's face it, you guys are working, you know, teachers work a lot more than people realize and, um, sharing resources can be really helpful, right? Yeah, definitely. It's really important that, you know, everyone's working together on, on the, you know, the same common goal and we help each other. Uh, yeah. I think that's so important. Uh, so, you know, you can get me on LinkedIn. I'm on Ed Moore, LinkedIn, Ed with two Ds. 
uh, on LinkedIn. Also, I've got a Facebook page, um, Get to Net Zero with Ed Moore, um, which you know I do uh, webinars every month uh, on there with a with another company uh, who I work um, closely with, who have designed like the first um, the first refill glue stick. Uh, amazing, really amazing product. Uh, nowhere in the world uh, has anybody come up with the concept. And it's also um, a quality glue, glue stick as well. They've basically taken the water out of the glue stick and um, it's so much more stickier. It sticks the first time, not the third time sort of thing. So, um, and you end up using less as well, less glue and you save money. It's a Fantastic. Win -win. All right. And I think it would probably be helpful if we shout out a few of the organizations that help to weave the curriculum, the environment into the curriculum, because I know you have, You've taken some uh, courses with various projects as well, and the Harmony Project comes to mind. But any other resources that you want to talk about here? Yeah, so uh, obviously the Harmony Project, you know, they, they've they've got some fantastic resources and some resources that are coming out quite soon as well. So it's definitely worth going on their website and checking that out. Uh, Carbon Literacy Project, they're doing some great stuff. Uh, teaching teachers and as well as children um, all the language behind carbon um, carbon literacy and climate change and what you need to look out for so they're doing some fantastic stuff obviously Jane Goodall uh, you know it's uh, in age, institution like amazing um, you know 88 years old and still going absolutely phenomenal yes um, you know, and also Eco Schools, Eco Schools International organization that, you know, you can work towards uh, to get their eco green flag. And they've got some great resources and great step by steps of how to get there. And, um, you know, that's that helped us with our journey. So, yeah, I highly recommend them too. Fantastic. OK, so one more shout out, guys. And that is that I want to remind you that Ed and I have put together a green checklist in our 11 point green checklist for schools. If you go to nataliepace.com forward slash blog and just put in green checklist, you'll easily find it. Or you can actually email our team at info at nataliepace.com and, um, and there we would be happy to send you the link to this. So Ed, I hope you're sharing that as well with others. Um, Hang on one second. Now, the last thing is that this is going to be available for everybody to watch at youtube.com forward slash at earth gratitude. So I do encourage everybody to share this with their friends. So youtube.com forward slash or at earth grat gratitude at earth gratitude. All right, Ed, thank you so much for joining me today. If you have any last words of wisdom, share them now. Keep going, keep going. Don't give up um, and don't take no for an answer. Um, you know, what you're, what everyone is doing is fantastic. We're all, you know, helping each other. And if there's anything that I, you think that I can do that I can help with or point you in the right direction, then, you know, please get in contact. Great. Thank you so much. And on behalf of all of us, thank you for doing such phenomenal work with the with the four to nine year old best green lobby in England, uh, the kids at Damer's first school in Poundbury. Thanks again. Right, thank you.